Two boys, 14-year-old John and 15-year-old Mark, entered an alleyway in Altricum as means of a shortcut. Moments later, Mark ran from the alley, urgently dialing the police. His friend, John, lay in a pool of blood and close to death having been brutally stabbed. The blade punctured his liver and came dangerous close to his other organs. Despite the loss of blood and injuries, John clung to life and was quickly transported to the nearest hospital where his condition stabilised. The police interviewed both boys who identified the attacker as a hooded figure whom they encountered in that alley and came at them with a knife. Whilst attempting to escape, John fell and was brutally assaulted leaving Mark to raise the alarm. The police, now looking for a hooded attacker, took to the CCTV footage and launched a citywide manhunt. But what followed next was to become one of the strangest cases in legal history, one with its foundations deeply rooted within cyberspace. Were the boys the target of a random robbery gone horribly wrong, or a calculated attempted murder devised by a twisted mind? The truth will shock you. This is the insane but true tale of the cyberspace assassin. Mark was a loner who found solace in the internet. Unable to create friendships away from the screen, Mark became obsessed with chat rooms, specifically MSN. To gain access, all which was needed was an MSN or Hotmail email address, and then at your fingertips you would find yourself with numerous rooms and hundreds of other chatters from all around the world. It didn't require any face-to-face -face contact, it was purely text, and perfect for the socially awkward Mark to make friends and chat in a seemingly consequence-free environment. Mark quickly formed friendships with a number of online chatters. One was a girl, a 16-year-old named Rachel, with whom Mark developed an online relationship. For Mark, Rachel was his girlfriend. They spoke every night, sharing their deepest thoughts and engaged in explicit dialogue. Rachel then introduced Mark to her circle of friends, whom all conversed via a private chat room. These friends included John, along with numerous other boys and girls of a similar age. Mark, Rachel and John and the others spoke nearly every night and Mark had what he had long desired, acceptance into a tight circle of friends with which he could speak freely. He was finally part of a community, surrounded by friends whom he could relate to, and it wasn't long before he was spending every waking moment online. Mark and John quickly became good friends having discovered that they lived within a reasonable community distance. Whilst the others, including Rachel, lived at various locations around the country, making a physical meet extremely difficult. Mark and John met one Saturday afternoon, triggering the start of a firm friendship. Then things changed. A new member entered the circle, an older man, Ted, who lived close to Rachel. Mark watched as Rachel and Ted forged a friendship on his very screen and arranged to meet. He felt his online relationship with Rachel was collapsing and like a real relationship, Mark felt like a jilted boyfriend. As time moved on, Rachel and Ted revealed they had met and were now in a relationship. Both of them disappeared from chat altogether. Some time later, Mark was chatting with John and the others when suddenly one of the participants logged in and informed the group that Rachel had been killed. That participant had heard on the local news that Rachel and Ted's relationship had broken down, leading Ted to stalk and kill Rachel. Mark was desperate to discover the truth for himself, but with only an email address for both Ted and Rachel, there was precious little information to find either party outside of cyberspace. Despite an exhaustive search, Mark could not find Rachel or the story of her demise. Months later, Mark was still chatting on MSN. The circle of his friends had changed. Some left whilst new ones were introduced. Mark and John were still close friends and regularly met. Then, one evening.
Janet indicated that John was part of a secret monarch bloodline and was protected by MI5. She went on to make amazing claims that should the present royal family fail, that John would ultimately be moved to the throne, and that he would be given access to a secret control room from which all the compiled knowledge of the world and the control of the armed force of the United Kingdom. Mark was clearly sceptical. The following morning, Mark sat at the bench and waited with phone in hand. 9am came and Mark nearly left when... Mark opened the message. Mark looked to the bin and found a brown paper bag with his name on it. He opened it and found £500 with a note. Mark took the money and began reporting back to Janet everything he and John discussed and did. Every week, he was directed to a new place where money, sometimes as high as a £1,000, waited for him. Janet's request for information increased and began ordering Mark to spend more time with John. Whenever Mark suggested that it was too much, Janet would offer more money and even went as far as to promise him a sexual encounter with herself. No matter how close he came to quitting, Janet managed to find a way to spur Mark on. Then, in the June of 2004, after months of spying, Janet dropped a bombshell. Mark was shocked. Believing Janet, he sat there and was direct on how to go about killing John. Even what to say is he stabbed him to death. It's important that you tell him you love him. Mark and John arranged to meet in Altricum. Prior to the meeting, Mark had gone to a nearby shop and purchased a knife which he hid under his shirt, following Janet's orders. Mark then directed John down an alleyway, implying it was a shortcut to a new arcade. They had reached a dark corner, exactly as Janet had described, as if she had viewed the scene herself. It was then that he struck. Taking the knife out, Mark pushed John against a wall and stabbed him repeatedly. Mark cried as he attacked, telling John that he loved him. Leaving John dying, Mark ran from the alley and called the police as instructed. He quickly disposed of the knife and set about telling the police about a hooded assailant. Police chased as many leads for the mysterious hooded attacker as possible and launched an urgent appeal for witnesses. However, when the police looked at the CCTV footage, they couldn't find any evidence of the attacker entering or leaving the alley. Suspicion was now turned towards Mark and the police halted the manhunt for the fictitious attacker. It wasn't long before a case was built and Mark was arrested. Now in police custody, and without access to Janet, whom had disappeared since the attack, Mark caved and confessed. He told the police everything, including Janet and MI5. The police were all but convinced that Janet was a figment of his imagination, until computer experts recovered thousands of lines of text from Mark's computer, supporting his story. Now police were faced with a mystery. Who had Mark been talking to? Who had twisted this young boy from an isolated loner into a killer? The police returned to the very beginning and experts analysed everything. It was then that they began to notice something very strange. Mark had been chatting to numerous people, dozens in fact over the months, men and women of different ages and backgrounds, and all located all over the country and some overseas. However, even though their chat speak was different, there were peculiar commonalities. For instance, common spelling mistakes. Rachel, Ted, Janet and most of the others made the same errors. Police then quickly deduced that nearly everyone Mark and John were chatting to were in fact the same person. Now faced with the possibility that an individual had cleverly engineered a hit on a young boy by twisting the mind of another, the police were faced with a chilling possibility. Someone out there in cyberspace was manipulative enough to convince someone to kill and was prepared to kill a child. Then, after more analysis, the police made a startling discovery. John made the same errors. When confronted with the evidence, John, still recovering from the attack, confessed to everything. 
He had created numerous online accounts and personas, pretending to be many people at the same time, yet cunningly keeping each character's consistent behaviour and styles. At times, he would manufacture ingenious ways to explain the disappearance and reappearance of certain characters. When Mark began pushing Rachel for a meet, John created a new persona to act as her boyfriend and then manufactured her death. When asked about Janet and the plan to kill himself, John's reply was cold and disturbing. All he said was, I wanted to know how far I could take this. When the case reached court, the expert witnesses and psychologists described John's actions as a deliberate attempt to take his own life. The judge, like many others, found the case bewildering and unique. He described the case as extraordinary and that the skilled writers of fiction would struggle to conjure up a plot such as this which arises here. Mark was served with a two-year supervision order and banned from making contact with John. John was served with a three-year supervision order and was banned from using the internet without accompanied by an adult. John was banned from access to internet chat rooms even if supervised. Mark and John's identities to this day remain a mystery. The internet is a marvel of technology and will be regarded as one of the greatest achievements of mankind. It connects us all, regardless of where we are, across the street or the other side of the planet. Everyone with a screen can be contacted within a few keystrokes. But with this platform comes its own perils. For Mark, it was the opportunity to be what he felt he couldn't be in real life. He had the attention and friendships he craved. But ultimately, it was all a lie. He had become embroiled in an intricate web conjured by the mind of a brilliant, if not twisted, 14-year-old. Why John took it as far as he did will never be fully understood. What is understood is the danger a manipulating individual with patience on their side can have on another. When we speak to another person on the internet, it is important that we must always ask the question, are you really who you say you are?